Hello, everyone, and welcome to another fabulous eChapter meeting. I am so glad to be with you all today. I know I sound like a broken record, but once again, our eChapter just keeps growing and growing. You know it's my favorite thing I get to do. We started 2017 with more than 23,000 eChapter members, and now we have over 32,000 eChapter members. It is by far our most successful and member-appreciated networking benefit, and I think that's pretty amazing. So hello everyone, I am Star Jones, president of NAPW and the Professional Diversity Network. I'm absolutely thrilled to witness this, this growth, this explosive growth of our eChapter initiative. And I really thank each and every one of you for making our bi-weekly virtual meetings engaging and heartfelt and inspiring. The NAPW eChapter really is networking at its best and for busy professional women on the go, it provides access to your network from wherever you are. I am a bit of an exhibit today. Uh, I can be your example of the ability to network wherever you are and no matter what you look like. So first of all, let me apologize for my very casual, natural look today. I've just returned from Shanghai and Beijing, China this week, and I suffered a bit of a severe allergy attack that affected my eyes due to the air quality in Beijing. Sure, you've heard about the air quality in Beijing. Well, my doctors recommended some topical solutions that really don't allow for the traditional star glam. You know, I can't do the lashes and I can't do the makeup for 48 hours. So this is the last few hours. So you get just me in the raw today. That's how much I trust you girls. And this is the way you network wherever, whenever, and whatever you look like. So today we're going to discuss women in leadership and identify the factors that many times keep us from reaching our full potential and desired roles. I really am the first to applaud women for our overall success. Women are obtaining degrees, launching businesses, and shattering glass ceilings like never before. We have truly come a long way and are becoming a competitive match for our male counterparts. I'm sure this does not come as a surprise to you. But we do still have a long way to go, ladies. While close to 52% of professional jobs are indeed held by women, we're substantially underrepresented in the leadership roles. Only 14.6% of executive officers, 8.1% of top earners, and 4.6% of Fortune 500 CEOs are women. Those numbers don't look good. It is clear that even with all our collective success, we have not earned our proper seat at the table. When it comes to women accessing leadership roles and being effective leaders, there are barriers that are completely beyond our control, such as wage gap and gender bias and simply being held to higher standards than men. And you know, we've talked about this many times before. However, there are also some obstacles that we ourselves can knock down because we are in the driver's seat. These are in our hands. So that's our focus today. Now what we can't control, what we can control. So let's dive right in, ladies, and discuss how to lead like a girl, okay? Number one, utilize an impactful network, okay? That's what I got right here. It's no secret that professional men have mastered the art of networking. They are well-connected. They have no issues supporting each other within their good old boy network. As women, we too have abilities to build and utilize strong networks. I say it all the time and I mean it. We must network purposefully, making the proper connections and building professional relationships with people who are seeking the type of skills you have is absolutely imperative to growing your network. Number two, be bold and speak up. It's time to stop being a little mealy mouth, okay? Several statistics show that oftentimes women are not getting promoted into leadership positions or obtaining raises simply because we do not ask. We must be bold. I remember that a uh, lean in was written and I laugh all the time because I didn't need anybody to tell me to lean in. I lean in so hard, I'm darn near perpendicular. I am telling you truthfully. What is that old saying? A closed mouth does not get fed. Well, you know what I mean. Most of the time, when companies have leadership positions available, they promote from within. If you have the skill set and leadership capabilities for any desired position, make your interests known and present what you can bring to the table and illustrate how you will successfully fulfill that role. Again, you know I always tell you, when you're trying to get a promotion, a bonus, 
a salary increase, you need to show the value you bring to that organization. Let me go to number three. Don't make your family an excuse. Make them a reason. To no surprise, the number one reason women do not seek leadership roles is due to our obligations at home. Oh, there's no time to lead a corporation. My family needs me more. Well, we've all felt this before. This is my first year of actually having a family that um, I have to balance. I have to integrate, you know, a year old stepson, or I like to say bonus son. Um, I'm getting on a plane on Friday morning from New York to make sure I get there for his high school uh, visitation. He, there's a school he wants to go to, and he wants me standing there next to him as we do that tour. So I understand. But let me encourage you to make your family your motivation and not hold you up, because that's the way I see your whole family succeeds. You can have both. You might not be able to have them both equally at the same time. You will have to juggle, and you will inv and inevitably have to occasionally disappoint someone demanding more of you than you can currently give. The disappointment is temporary. Over the span of my career, I've learned the more you delegate, the less you disappoint. Uh-oh, let me say that again. The more you delegate, the less you disappoint. You don't have to be all things to all people at the same time. Delegating is a part of leadership, and it is the secret to integrating the balance of work and home. Number four, lead instinctively. Okay, women are wired with great instincts combination of instinct, logic, and reason wins. Instinct causes us to trust ourselves and have a little faith in what we cannot see. If we want to get and stay ahead, we have to see beyond facts and figures and be true visionaries and see the bigger picture and never underestimate a woman's intuition. And finally, number five, chat away. Yes, not that we need research to prove it, but women are more chatty and wordy than men. Mm -hmm. I'm not telling you something you don't know. And while most of us try to suppress our chatterboxes at work, it's actually beneficial to your career. Being talkative is the best way to develop cohesion and share information, which makes us phenomenal leaders. So don't say, don't listen to people that talk too much. That's how I lead, ladies. So I ask you, what kind of leader will you be? Again, I want to encourage you not to get overwhelmed with obstacles that are beyond your control. And I urge you to focus on what is within your power to control and be the best effective leader that you can be. There is nothing negative about leading like a girl. We are resilient and savvy, and it is our goal through these informative and inspirational sessions to lift you up and push you until you've reached your leadership potential. Today, you're in good hands. I have some awesome women who are the very best at what they do and they are ready to pour into you. So I hope you're excited. Be the sponge that soaks it all up. Enjoy today's e-chapter meeting, and may you be inspired to live your very best life. Enjoy the rest of your afternoon, ladies. Thank you, Star, and welcome, everyone. So excited to be on here with you. Um, our live e-chapters are held once a month, and our replays are held bi-weekly, either at noon or at 4 p.m. Eastern. So you can come back, listen again, and live network with new attendees from around the country. E-chapter has taken the stage. E-chapter has taken the stage. Not only fostering real-time networking, but has also developed into also offline and in-person connections and business contacts. We also hope that you're taking full advantage of another extremely popular NAPW online event, which I had the privilege to also moderate, is our e-coaching, which offers exclusive coaching on relevant topics from NAPW experts and even more networking opportunities. Please look out for invites and promotional, promotional emails on social media and our website on NAPW.com. We encourage you to carve out the time and keep coming back to our online events because it's a ease and the ability to network from your office while on the road or even in the comfort of your own home. So in the chat room with you today are some additional corporate moderators to assist in the chat and, of course, help you along the way. They are Samantha Pocorny. She's our Program and Engagement Manager. 
who will be doing her best to offer any technical support is needed. She's amazing. Our local chapter representatives are Natalie Fikes, which is our Atlantic, Atlanta chapter president, and also our central regional manager. And then my other colleague, Ruth Garcia, which is also an amazing woman, Los Angeles chapter president and Western regional manager, are all available to answer any questions and chapter related questions that you may have. So, on to our live panel discussion. During our panel today, you will see several times a poll pop up on your screen during our discussion. So please take a minute, answer the questions, and we'll share your input. It is now time to introduce to you our NAPW panel that will be sharing their insight on the topic today, recognizing and applauding your leadership skills and breaking down barriers. With over 20 years of experience in both corporate and small business arenas, Ann Tipper is recognized for her developmental leadership style ability to break down complex issues into attainable solutions and create process efficiencies. Starting as a secretary with Home Depot and worked her way up to regional director of operations over five states and $3 billion in sales. Impressive. After retiring from Home Depot in 2014 and founded AP Development and Solutions, where she helps both organizations and individuals succeed through executive business consulting and coaching. And is also the CFO and COO of Point of Solutions, president of the Celtic, or Celtic Life and Heritage Foundation, and author of Moving Up, Tangible Tools for Women in the Workplace. Welcome, Anne. Also, um, our next um, panelist is Jessica Fister Johnson. She leads the National Retail Sales Large Store Sales and Customer Development Team for 30 retail partners located within the central region, including Target, Super Value, Major, Brookshire Groceries, Aldi, and Giant Eagle, representing approximately $1 billion in annual system revenue. Again, amazing recognition. These ladies are just fantastic. Jessica has been with the Coca-Cola system for 20 years and has earned the Progressive Grocer 2015 Top Woman in Grocery Industry Award and is currently a VIP Woman of the Year Circle member in the National Association of Professional Women prior to her current role. Her Coca-Cola system experience includes most recently the commercialization of marketing programs, innovation launches, media purchasing, and after negotiations, as well as activations throughout the South region as Vice President Region of Commercialization. She also has extensive experience in the areas of sales, planning, and revenue management, category advisory services, and cross-license partnerships. Jessica holds a communications degree from California State University, Sacramento, and is a board member of the Boys and Girls Club in Collin County. Thank you. Um, and then our third panelist is Mary Ottman. She is a leadership igniter, rapid results business coach, and professional speaker with an MBA and a master's in leadership and management combined with rising through the ranks of a male-dominated engineering organization. Mary has forged a successful 27 year, 27 plus, sorry, year career, transforming herself from an electrical engineer to successful executive leading multi-generational teams. A true believer in living life to the fullest. Mary spent several years as a country singer, songwriter, performing at venues like Famous Bluebird Cafe. She has hiked the Rocky Mountain Trail, I mean, amazing woman, in Africa, and jumped off the top of a 108-story building on purpose. How did you do that on purpose? That's amazing. Um, I don't know that I could do that. But Mary is a unique combination of spontaneous adventure, reformed code player, project management professional, and associate director formally managing 150 rocket sciences. 
Her mission is to empower leaders who are seriously committed to up-leveling their results with strategies and tools that move them forward to rapidly crush the big goals. So let us begin, and thank you ladies for joining us on our panel today. We're gonna jump right into the topic. Why does leading like a girl make women great leaders? It's important we embrace who we are and how, and how by leading like a girl. How does that bring value to a team that does not recognize your skills to be essential? Let's go ahead and start with Anne. Would you like to answer that question? Yeah, I think um, so many times we try to mold ourselves into what we think people want to want us to be, and specifically in the last um, you know a few decades, it's been what men are. And we've also been told that like, don't lead with your emotion, don't be so emotional, buck up, have thick skin, all these things. And so as a result, we've tried to conform ourselves into an idea or an image that does not work for us. And I think that when you, when you look at leading like a girl, it's using what we have as women to our advantage. And I want to expand a little bit on what Star said, and that having to do with using our instinct. And I'm going to put emotion in there as a part of that instinct. Our emotion, I would suggest, is our first line of defense. It's our early warning system. And a lot of times before our mind, our, our conscious mind knows what's going on, our emotions tell us that there's something there for us to look at, whether it's because someone is coming at us or because there's some information our subconscious has put together that we need to pay attention to. And that leads us to our instincts. Our subconscious is pulling millions of pieces of information all the time and giving it to us. And that's where our instinct comes in. And if we can tap into that instinct, then we it gives us um, information that we just don't have access to. Now, if we only react to something instinctually and emotionally, then it, 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 doesn't, uh, it doesn't go well for us because we can't back it up. But what I would say is that you use that instinct to direct you on where you go and what you need to do, and, and then gather the information that you need to back it up so that you don't look like you're being emotional. But it's such an amazing tool for us to use to guide us. When I was a regional director at Home Depot, I had 100 stores that I had to go into, and I only got to them one time a year. And so I had all my reports and I did my homework as far as knowing what I wanted to look for. But when I walked into that store and started walking around the different departments and areas of the store, I would allow my instinct to say, look at this, ask this question. And I was rarely ever wrong. And I wouldn't always know why I was asking the question. But my instinct just would say, go take a look at this. And then when I did that and I would start asking the questions and gathering the information, that's what then enabled me to be able to back up what my instinct said. Now, I didn't tell people, I'm going on instinct here. I would just ask the questions. But it's amazing. We as women, we have such power in our instinct and using our emotions as a tool for us rather than it working against us. And that, to me, is leading like a girl, using our advantages, our uniqueness as females, and uniqueness in the way our brains work in order to help not only ourselves be successful, but more ideally, all of those around us and organizations be successful. Excellent. Thank you so much. And I do want to make sure that everyone answered that question, the poll that was on there. I know that the results are still coming in. Um, but it, it's very valuable what you said. We have the same features that we can totally utilize to our advantage. And I really appreciate that. Um, so I do want to point to the fact that we were asking the question, which of the following char characteristics would you prefer your leaders to adopt to deal with the complex work environment of today? It, interestingly enough, it says leaders should incorporate more than team building, sorry, more team building events that team members can attend together away from the office to build camaraderie amongst the group. So 11% answered. I know the, the, the poll's still coming in, the answers are still coming in, but that's the majority of the, of the answers. And I totally agree. I think it's important 
that we all connect on a different level outside of work, you'd be you'd realize how much more relationships, um, loyalties, and so forth, we're more willing to to work together and go further. So the next question I have, and I'm going to direct this one to Scott, is while us women have made great strides, and what do you think? Sorry, I hear some feedback. Sorry. While us women have made great strides, what do you think is holding women back? Have you also ever experienced a situation where other women leaders are dismissing your value, and how have you overcome the situation? Jessica. You have been. Great. Thank you very much, Allie. Um, it's a great question. And a couple of things that come to mind in terms of what's holding women back and what's held myself back personally is being uh, in new situations and I have this fear of fear and that I'm going to make a mistake and that is going to lead to rejection in the role and within a broader team. Um, that, that's a primary thing that holds has held myself back and I think it's fair uh, that other people may have experienced that as well. You also asked the question on whether or not when someone else has been dismissing my value and how I've decided to overcome that. One is using one of the skills that I think uh, was addressed in the first one is using your instinct, but what we're really good at and Star mentioned is innately building relationships. And when we do that, we do that by getting other people in the conversation opening up the dialogue pathways, getting them to share their points of view. And what that tends to do for myself is begin to minimize the risk and create a greater understanding and reduce that fear of rejection. Mistakes are going to happen. And our ability to begin to accept those mistakes as learning platforms and not as failures, uh, they can help us propel moving forward. And I think that's how I've addressed it in the past and uh, creating a common language for us to share together has helped minimize and eliminate the um, where I always felt I was being dismissed for the value. It made it easier for me to demonstrate where I could both add value in the hard skills as well as in the soft skills. Interesting. Thank you so much, Jessica. Mary, do you want to add anything to that? Uh, absolutely. Mary, do you want to add anything? Can you hear me? Can you hear me now? I think you can hear me, right? Yeah, okay, good. Can hear you. Yes, absolutely. So, um, you know, in terms of other women um, not speaking to our value or recognizing our value, you know, I think the key here is I absolutely 1000% believe that we women should, we have an advantage actually if we lead like women. And so I, uh, like you mentioned, had the 27 years in Army Civil Service, uh, which was male dominated. But over the years, you know, we we women don't get the access uh, up front to leadership classes and courses that, uh, and we didn't back then, surely, that um, the men did. And so really all we could do was emulate our leaders that we had, right? And so, you know, I won't use the language here that got used in the Army, you know, but, you know, so you you learn, okay, you get ahead if you're super aggressive, if you're, if you cut to the chase, if you do this, and, and sure, you can have some level of success, but those techniques aren't working anymore with the millennials that are coming in, right? And so, I actually even was raised by grandparents, so I'm like the ultimate multi-generational expert, right? And, and then in the Army, I actually worked with a guy that was 80, we had 70s, 60s, 50s, 30s, 20s, and even teens. So talk about multi-generational teams, right? But I think the key here, first of all, when women or men, uh, first of all, y'all look at this hair. Come on now. And, and this accent. Now y'all, y'all like, now she did not manage rocket scientists. Now y'all know y'all did that. So everybody does that, right? You do get judged on your appearance. You get judged on your voice. And that's okay. You know, my mantra is don't take it personally, even when it's personal. Because when you're a leader, people are watching. And if another woman discounts you as a leader or another man, if anybody, I, I try not to 
to um, differentiate. If anybody takes me um, the wrong way, then that's on them, and they'll figure it out, you know. And here's the bottom line. Everybody wants to do well in their job, and if you're helping your boss to be successful, and if you're helping your organization meet its mission and its needs, and if, most of all, if you're helping your customers get solutions that, you know, propel them forward, people are, will recognize your value and you will skyrocket. So the key is, you know, one thing about us women is we do tend to, we, we are emotional and we do, you know, you can only take so many punches, right, till you start feeling a little bruised. So, you know, tend to your self-care, go have a girl's night, you know, take it out of the office. But you know, don't take it personally, even when it's personal and know when to let things go. Um, so, you know, in terms of uh, leading like a girl, another point is be confident. And if you don't have it yet, act as if, you know, that's why my book I recommended was, we'll talk about it in a little bit, but the, it focuses on that. We, I, My personal opinion is we hold ourselves back. So, but maybe we'll talk about that a little bit more later. I agree, and actually, I, uh, there's a poll question that's going on. I'm interested in seeing the results. Is uh, about women and breaking barriers and why the leadership opportunities haven't been there and so forth. So I'm interested to see what the ladies have to to respond. So, in perfect timing, despite all the progress made today, women have yet to cross through the glass ceiling in large numbers. This is most likely to do with which of the following? Interesting. Women are given fewer opportunities to occupy leadership roles, which to executive leadership roles, which is 11% of the, the group has answered that particular question. My personal opinion, which I think is going along with what you were saying, Mary, is women lack the confidence to apply for leadership positions the way that men do. I think that we all need to believe in ourselves a little bit more. Definitely, that's a close second um, answer. But um, it's interesting. So with that said, um, the next question is, for me personally, it's important to support one, one another and celebrate our differences and really be able to collaborate. Ladies, do you have other women on your team that, are current, that you're currently assisting with their career growth? And if so, how do you encourage the behavior for them to do the same with other team members? We're going to go back to Ann on that one. Um, real quick before I answer that, I want to address the, the um, women and the glass ceiling and such, and I want to just make two quick points. The first one is I would say almost in every situation we hold ourselves back. It's not what someone else is doing for us or not, it's that we're holding ourselves back. And the reason I would say that is because women tend to, um, when they look, for a, look at a position or to apply for uh, something or to go for a promotion or what have you, we look and say, have we, do we already have the skill sets to do it? Have we already checked off all of the boxes? And if we have about 90% of it, then we step up and say, okay, yes, I think I'm qualified for this. And I want to say on the reverse, men look at that and if they qualify for about 60%, then they go after it because they believe they can learn the rest of it when they get there. And they also, not only do they go after that at 60%, but they also expect a 110% um, dollars for it, where we are like, well, I can't even apply for it. So what happens is women tend to be about 30% more competent than their male counterparts. But men, I would suggest, this is unscientific, but men say they're probably about 30% more confident. And I would really challenge ladies to not wait for someone else to give you an opportunity or someone else to give you a leadership class, or someone else to say, hey, you should do this, but go after it if you've got 60% of the qualifications and, and be confident that you can learn it, that you've got resources, that you can take transferable skill sets. So that, and then the other thing, I know I'm taking a little bit longer, the other thing I would say is be action-centric. What happens is by our location, we tell people that we are in support roles rather than the leader, or that we can be the leader. So when, we, when we're someplace and we sit at the back of the room or on the side of the room instead of in the middle, or we don't give our opinion, or we don't get in that center place where the decisions are made, we're telling everyone around us that we don't belong there, that we belong as a support role instead of in the action making decisions. So I would really, really encourage women to, and, and you know what, it can be scary. 
it can be scary to say, okay, let me do this. And then you go home and go, oh my gosh, what did I do? What did I get myself into? And I can't tell you how many times that I was promoted because I was confident and I went after it. And then I get home and tell my husband, oh my gosh, I don't know if I can do this job. That part you work through because you can learn it. And we are so capable and we are so competent. We don't give ourselves the credit in our confidence. So um, to answer the other question, I'll really brief on, on the um, women on the team. It's really, I think, is helping the mindset change. That's the biggest impact I feel we can make in helping women on our teams is changing that mindset and helping them, to, encouraging them to help other women change their mindset that, yes, they can do it. And we tend to sometimes get competitive with each other instead of realizing we're on the same team. And as we lift each other up, everybody gets lifted. Thank you, and I'm gonna go ahead and ask Jessica the same question. And I will, I will tell you something. One of the, my favorite phrases that Star repeats again and again is that there's a special place in hell for women that don't help other women. So it, it, it's interesting how we all sometimes just compete and compete, and we really should help each other. So Jessica, how do you help other team members, and how do you encourage the same behavior? You bet. Thank you. Um, and great insights from both Mary and Anne. There's a couple of more specific actions, and that's related to really understanding where you want to go in your career, either with this organization or with a different organization, and engaging your leadership on that journey. And so I create development plans for men and women uh, that are direct reports of mine, and we work together on helping them achieve those objectives. So often we see something and we're not clear on how do I get there. And more importantly, once we have a pathway that we've developed together and we've written it down, it creates joint accountability, um, and your leader can then become an advocate for you when you're not present in the room, and you become a better advocate for yourself because we've taken the time to give you the words and the language and a roadmap for your success inside of the organization to help build the confidence that we've been talking about that you're taking the necessary actions to achieve that. That's a replicatable process that um, I encourage and I do directly with my one-on-ones, but then they can do it with others that they participate in and help them create the pathways and connections and the networking. You heard Star talk about rigorous, vigorous earlier in the call. So that's the actions. The other thing that I personally do is I challenge myself to um, augment or change the mentor model mentor mentee model typically and for myself personally always thought about a mentor as someone i was looking up to and i define that as someone who was more tenured in their career um, they had a broader network of associates i've upended that and i have mentors now that are both uh, fulfill that description but that are also younger that are coming into the workplace so i have millennial uh, mentors that I often work with to better understand what's happening in the workplace from their perspective and then encouraging that with others and again we have a we try to give some shape to that mentor mentee relationship what are they looking out uh, what do they need from that relationship what am I looking for in that relationship and creating clarity so those are a couple of actions that have been very very helpful uh, in creating those pathways and helping to celebrate the differences that we have and the clarity. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So sorry about that. that. You know what? I value that tremendously, Jessica, because sometimes we always look up to those that, are, that have come before us when we're looking for guidance and to assist us and really keep that going, which is phenomenal. But you should also look around you, and the millennials definitely that have that are going to be following your footsteps. There's a lot to learn from everyone at every level in your organization. Um, personally, I do the same thing, especially with all the social media that's out there. They're more abreast of everything that's going on with that. The millennials are, so I always try to learn from everyone, no matter what. So thank you for that. 
Mary, do you want to go ahead and answer the same question? Mary? I think, I think she me. must still it's, it's okay. I'm Come on. Okay. Sorry. Brief technical, technical, technical difficulties. difficulties. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Hey, thank you. you. Okay. Yes, absolutely. So the original question for anybody who had to step away and come back um, was how do, do we encourage other ladies' behavior in terms of leadership? And so when I was coming up, you know, the model was let's all go sit in a room and listen to a really monotone person talk about leadership. And then once I figured out um, who some great mentors were, I had really great mentors, but a lot of times it was, you know, you had, and, and this is the way it should be. You should come with questions and, and, but it's very sporadic. You know, you have a breakfast meeting or you have a lunch meeting or whatever. And so what I tried to do in my own personal uh, mentorship was to create interactive um, scenarios. So, um, in the Army organization I was at, we had a mentor program and, you know, they recommended sit down with these guys and look at their resumes and help them with their training plans and, and all that's fine and good and I'm assuming someone else was taking care of that because I didn't, I didn't want to focus on that. So what I did was I had um, mock presentations. A lot of times the women um, that I would see in technical positions they're very monotone. They talk, you know, talk like this, and they turn around and actually like look like if my slides were back here, they they turn, you know, their voice is now at the mic because they're talking and they're looking at their slides like. And speaking is so important to me. It's like being able to type on your keyboard. If you have a fabulous idea, first of all, if you don't open your mouth to speak, no one hears it. But when you speak, you need to speak powerfully and confidently and present yourself in a certain way so that people understand your your technical capabilities and your leadership potential and so I would give them that safe space to actually practice that and we I would have them in a large auditorium that we had there at work and we actually filmed it because it's so I happen to have a background as the country music singer you guys heard that and so in performance classes we would record our performances and then you could go back yourself because people can tell you that you stink at presenting and in your mind you're like no I don't I'm good you just don't understand I, you know but if you see yourself and then you see what they're saying then you instantly can correct and go oh, okay and you just you buy in that much faster so I would record them and give them the um, I, not only I, but I brought in another panel of two PhD women that are very successful, um, very smart women, and they also gave their um, opinions of their uh, presentation, their technical presentation. So, you know, I, this multifaceted feedback is what I gave them. And, and another thing that I did was you know, in the Army, the um, interview process for those higher level jobs is very strange. I, I haven't heard of another organization that does this, but you come into a room and you sit down and a panel of people just stare at you and they've got their notes and they've got oh, a whole other notepad up here and they have their pad and they're just, they hand you a sheet with five questions on it and you just talk for 25 minutes and they don't ask any questions. You, they, you read the question and you just blah, 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 blah. So you can see I tend to talk fast. So, man, I'm peppering those suckers with, you know, every buzzword I can think of because you want to get the interview. But if you have never come into that where nobody's talking and, you know, so giving those mock interviews, letting people experience that in a safe environment so that they can be comfortable when, when everything's on the line, and then encouraging ladies to apply for jobs that you don't, really necessarily want it would be okay to get them don't apply for things that you absolutely don't want um, because then if you get it you might burn a bridge by having gone through the whole interview process but you know confidence is the thing we absolutely 1000 percent hold our own selves back and I couldn't agree more with Ann on that and you know when I left 
the government, I had, it was really interesting. I had several, several brilliant women set up appointments with me before I left. And they said, you know, before you leave, you know, I'm going to ask you, how did you get so confident? And, and how did you get these leadership positions? And, and I had just brilliant women. One um, was a master's degree in mechanical engineering. And she told me, she said, I never volunteered a brief leadership because I feel like I have to know every possible question the answer to every possible question they could ask, and I know I don't, so I don't volunteer. Well, that, whoop, whoop, time out, you know. So I had to tell her, "Hey, you bring your technical experts, your deep knowledge folks on areas you're not familiar with. You take the high level questions, and then if it gets to that point, you can acknowledge your team and bring them in and give them airtime with leadership too, right? So everybody, it's win win. Everybody gets face time. But just think about that. She never even briefs leadership. How are you going to get considered? For leadership positions, if leadership never sees you, your your knowledge and your skill, and that you're you know very articulate and those types of things. And then I had another lady who was a PhD come, and I said, you know, you should really consider applying for my job. Oh no, I'm not ready. I'm not ready. And I had to really work with her. Like, how can you not be? You know. And I said, finally, I said, okay, look. So I'm in the job. I know what it takes to do the job. And if I tell you that you should apply, you should believe me. <laughs> so that's a big thing. When people tell you you're ready and to apply, don't disagree with them. They see something in you. Go for it. Try, try. You know. So encouraging other women, a Agreed. is yeah, absolutely. You you tell them what their strengths are constantly. We need that feedback, right? And encourage them to just go for it. The Army leadership way. We're taught that leaders move forward with 80% information. You're never going to have 100% of the knowledge of where the, the bad guy is or whether you get 80% of the knowledge that you need and you make a decision and you go and you can justify yourself with 80%. You're never going to get 100%. You're never going to have 100% of the, the skills in a job application because you can't have, okay, so think about how that doesn't make sense. Nobody would ever move up ever if they had to have already had the job to get the job, right? And so if you think about it like that, it doesn't even make sense to think that, right? So go for it. That's the that's the bottom line. Thank you so much, Mary. It's so true. I I couldn't agree with you more, and I completely feel the same way. I always say to my team, something done today is better than nothing done perfect. And it's always something where you just have to get things done. So thank you so much. We have two more questions for our panelists, and I see that the chat room is going a million miles an hour, which I appreciate. And I do hope that you can hear me a lot better now. Um, multitasking can be overwhelming. Me, personally, as a mom, business owner, and my husband having a business, it's hard to keep track of your progress to prevent some of the stress and keep balance both professionally and personally. So ladies. What's the number one thing that you try to do to be able to balance these two these two items in your life, professional and personal? And I do want to remind everyone there is a poll question up on the screen. Now, Anne, let's start with you. I would say it's very important to draw your boundaries and so you know where your lines are and what you're willing and not willing to do. Um, the position, I'm going to go back to corporate um, because it, the examples I think are more relevant for these questions, is that um, when I was a regional director, my counterpart, I had other regions, I mean, they'd be working until sometimes 1 o'clock in the morning, and they'd be working on the weekend, and that was not acceptable to me. And so I told my team, unless a store is burning down or there's a bomb threat or there's something major going on, um, I'm not going to be responding to you after 6 p.m. Now, I had to have my phone with me 24-7 because I was over crisis management, regulatory compliance, and all the rest. So I still had it, but I designated times that were for work and designated times that were for home. And it needs to be realistic based on what your job is and the responsibilities of your job. So I had one time we had a death threat to an employee. And I had to be on the phone and I had on a Saturday because that was what the job entailed. But those were emergencies and exceptions. And I think really getting what getting yourself balanced is has to do with um, knowing what, what your boundaries are and where your lines are. 
The other thing I would say about balance is uh, you're never going to be perfectly balanced. And I'm going to equate it to a bicycle. You're on a bicycle. If you are perfectly balanced, you can sit on a bicycle and it will not flat fall over if you're standing still. The reality is, is to stay balanced, you go a little bit to the left and a little bit to the right all the time. But as long as you continue moving forward, you're able to stay on that bicycle upright. So there's going to be times where work's going to take a little more and home is going to take a little bit more. But the important part is that you go back and forth enough that you can keep that line and that bike moving. But the biggest thing I would say is understand where your, where your boundaries are and stick to your boundaries. Okay, I'm done. Are you there, yes, Allie? How do you, you hear me? Yes, there we go. You can hear me yes, now. Yes, you can hear me now. How do you keep in touch with everything? Yeah, it, it's such a great question, and it's one that's consistent. Yeah, it's such a great question, and it's one that's consistent. I'm, I'm a mom. I have two young children in this organization. Um, I have a loving husband. So all of these various demands and a great group of girlfriends that do it in community. And I actually like to take the word balance out as Anne sort of described the bicycle. And I like to use the word integration. And so how do you, how does the work in your personal life become integrated? And I think the formation of boundaries come with great clarity with what it is that you value. What is most important to you? How do you want to spend your time? And I'll share with you that uh, for myself, identifying what's most important helps to drive a better balanced feeling. I often find that our, tasks let, our task lists never work on paper, never. They are, um, the work or what it is that we want to get done always exceeds the time on the clock. But here's the way I would describe it when I'm really passionate about something is it doesn't feel as though it's taking as much effort when I'm very passionate about something that I'm doing, the, the activity that's maybe aligned with my values. I love my children very much. The PTA asks me to constantly be a part of the membership meetings and go to this and go to that. That feels like an incredible drain, and I get stressed out when I feel like I have to live up to someone else's expectations of going to the PTA meetings. So be bold. It doesn't align with my values. I don't go to the PTA meetings. And you know what I found? They were just as happy that I didn't show up. And I could find other ways to support them that better fit my lifestyle and in order to continue to support my children at their school. But it's finding that alignment and gaining that confidence for the um, activities that are most important to you that are aligned with your values and what you're most passionate about. And when that's where you put your efforts, it doesn't feel like I'm so out of balance personally. If you want to run a bike, if, excuse me, you want to participate in a bike race, you want to go back and get your master's degree, you will prioritize your life and those demands in order to achieve what's most important to you. Find out, listen to your heart, listen to your gut. We've been talking about that and identify what is most important to you and aligned with your values. That's when I find I'm in most balance. And then I'm a list person. So I love myself a little process and I take what's most important to me and then I give myself regular check-ins. Am I spending the time against what I said was most important? And here's the beauty. We can augment and change what's most important to us based on what's happening in our lives. We have the freedoms to reprioritize what's most important. So I hope that's helpful. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's a great example. We always try to do, you might want to mute yourself. We always try to do everything. We always want to accomplish the world, and it's really challenging when there's so much lying on our shoulders. So thank you for that. Now we're going to go on to the last question. I'm going to start with Mary. We need to learn to take the pressure off ourselves, which is exactly what we're talking about. What methods or best practices have you found most beneficial to you? Let's think about the practices that you've also applied not only in yourself, but used to increase productivity for your team and those around you. 
Okay, Mary. let me make sure I, so there's taking off the pressure, increasing productivity, which actually sounds like it's the opposite, but it actually can be the same direction. So taking the pressure off ourselves, first of all, okay, we women, especially us moms, have the mom guilt, right? So let's, okay, first of all, let's just give that up. Let's just give it up. I know it's hard. It's going to take, it took me about five years. So start your clocks. Today, everybody gets permission. No mom guilt. Because here's the thing. I went to this training class and I heard um, someone talking about uh, my dad. He came to all my games. I wanted to do things without him. and He would coach every game. Then I, then I wanted to learn guitar because he always did the sports things. And so over here, I thought he'd leave me alone. Well, then he started taking guitar. So he was upset that dad like was always there. And then you had the other side of the spectrum, which was, you know, mom was never there. She left and, you know, left us and blah, blah. And then there was someone else who'd actually had a parent commit suicide. So it was this entire spectrum of they're there too much to they're never there. And the teacher stopped for a second and he said, OK, all you parents, you, did y'all just get that? You're off the hook. Like nothing you do is going to be right. <laughs> so just like kind of like soak that in and do the Maya Angelou thing and do the best you can, you know, until you know better and then do better, you know. So taking the pressure off yourself is so important and realizing, you know, uh, in terms of leadership, I would say the most I've recently found actually in January, I got exposed to this tool that they had in the army. I've been there 27 years. Where has it been? But it's it's actually pretty brilliant. And it's called a personal leadership philosophy. And you can Google and get examples. But basically, you know, in terms of taking the pressure off yourselves, you know, this is basically a, a contract where you say, this is how I want to be seen as a leader. It's how I want to lead others. It's what I expect from my people. Do I expect proactivity? Do I expect a positive attitude or at least being able to disagree agreeably and respectfully in the workplace? You know, but, you know, when you put that out there, now people hold you accountable to it. So if you say, hey, I want to be a leader that respects work-life balance, and then you're, you put this out there to your people, and of course run this by HR first, make sure you do that before you publish anything, right? But when people see, you you know, hey, Ms. Ottman there, you said you respected work-life balance. Oh, oh. This is real life, y'all. I'm, like, I'm, on, I'm on an interview. Can you come back? Oh, you three no, okay. he's going to bark. I'm going to eat. No, no. Later, please. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> okay, so it's, it's real life. Yeah, it's, it is multitasking. Okay, so, but anyway, yeah, taking the pressure off yourself and increasing productivity in terms of that as a leader, respecting that people are um, full. They're not just job descriptions. You're not just your output. You are a person that could be going through divorce. You could be a person that's um, getting married or having a baby or just stressed out. And then so many people are suffering from depression and anxiety. Work is definitely not a place for therapy. It's not a therapy environment. You don't want to be the therapist for your people. But understanding that they are people and when they have to take off to do things. I mean, you know, I've uh, been divorced twice and I can tell you that when I had a leader who understood that I had things going on and gave me a little leeway with my schedule and everything, your, your people are so much more loyal and so much more just motivated to just knock it out of the park for you. So, you know, by taking the pressure off yourself and taking the pressure off of them as well and letting them know that you have an environment of understanding, you still got work to get done, don't get me wrong, but being flexible and letting them get, get that done however they can you absolutely increase the, the productivity of the team at large. Sorry for the uh, interruption. Thank you, Mary. It's okay. It's not a problem. Thank you so much, Mary. I really appreciate it. Um, I have the question of the poll was, you're in a meeting on a conference room where, is the, where there's a big oval table in the center of the room and the chairs all around the outside. Where do you choose to sit often? And the majority 
which I'm very proud of, said at the table, which is great. It goes back to what we were talking about, confidence. We all have to step out of our comfort zones and really step into that role, take take everything um, into your own hands and really try to excel no matter what. So definitely sit at the table all the time. You should you should have a say in everything that you do. I We are running short on time, so I'm going to ask Anne and Jessica to quickly give us at least one tip of how you release stress um, to take the pressure off. Jessica? So in addition to what I already shared, just very quickly, one of the tips that I do is make certain that I'm caring for myself. So I will be very mindful around what I'm fueling my body with relative to food um, and getting enough exercise so I can put that additional or nervous energy around being able to accomplish what I want to accomplish. But thank you. Thanks for the time today. No, thank you, Jessica. Uh, We need to recognize when good enough is good enough and not try to make every single thing we do at this really high level. There's definitely areas and times for that excellent, high level, high quality, perfect, like really good numbers or whatever. But that's not the case in every area of our lives and giving ourselves permission to accept when good enough is good enough. One specific uh, tip that I use or or process that I use with people is what is the minimum that has to get done for this project, for this uh, report, for this whatever it is. Start with the minimum and then build from there. So that depending on what else is going on in life, you've got the crux of what you needed done first. And then as you have time or as you have resources, you can build from it but that everything does not need to be here, except understand when good enough is good enough. Thank you, that's actually a very good tip. We're always trying to perfect everything. Uh, Well, before we wrap up, I do wanna share the panelists' picks for the books that that each of the panelists have suggested that they wanted to share with you. So Anne, your book choice is Lean In. Tell us about that. So I had a couple different ones, and this is the one that was put. The biggest thing on Lean In, and I'm guessing that a lot of you have already read it, but the biggest thing that I would take away from this book that I would hope that you would all take away, and Jessica talked about this a little bit in the beginning, is what would you do if you're not afraid? And fear stops us so much. Fear of failure, fear of of, uh, not being right, fear of, of not whatever. Fear of disappointing people, fear, whatever that fear is. But what would you do if you were not afraid? That's the biggest thing I took away from this book. It will actually help lead and direct you on where you want to go and where where um, where's a good fit for you and where your passions are and where's your heart in. So that would be the biggest takeaway for me is lean in, is what would you do if you were not afraid? Excellent. Thank you so much, Anne. Jessica, your book choice is What Got You Here Won't Get You There. I love that book. Tell us why that would be your pick. It happens to be one of my favorites in in that it's looking at skills and nuances. So Star talked earlier about control the controllables. So you're moving into a new role. You've taken the risk, and there are some subtle activities that sometimes we're blind to, and this draws them out into the open and gives you really good action steps to begin to cultivate and shape improved behaviors that are going to uh, seed you for success in your new leadership role. And it can be used in any new role. It's not just about moving up the ladder. It's about moving around in an organization as well. So uh, it's one of my favorites and one that I gift to all of my uh, friends and colleagues that are moving into new positions. Thank you. That's actually a very good gift. Thank you. And Mary, The Confidence Code, this is actually one book that was recommended to me by my mentor. Why is it that it's your book choice? So I read this this year, and it's absolutely just interesting. These two journalists go out, and they're looking for how to build confidence in women. And they interviewed these 
everybody from, you know, regular folks like us all the way to these titans of leadership, a woman general, the lady that runs the International Monetary Fund. And across the spectrum, they found that all women on some degree or another deal with imposter syndrome and that inner critic. And so just looking at all the research they did and the interviews they did is so interesting. And I think it's, it's core to my tip, which is just say yes when opportunity comes when people recognize something in you and offer you an opportunity just say yes and then go home and get get the props that you need from other people like <laughs> somebody was saying they go home and talk to their husband about it and you can figure it out very rarely and i was in the rocket science business very re rarely is leadership rocket science it's you're the hub you're the person that connects people and figures out the, the people piece i love the book what got you here won't get you there because what got it because you're getting promoted to something you're not used to you can figure this out that's my tip this confidence code will help you get the confidence to do that nor the inner critic jump in say yes to opportunity and then figure it out and then you've got this great e-chapter network which can uh, help support you on your goals. And uh, I also do a corporate training on this and um, speaking. So uh, if you want to hear more, I would love to, to help anybody. Give me a shout. I would love to help anybody. Just grab it. Grab your opportunity and run. Thank you. Thank you so much, ladies. You are amazing women. I really do appreciate it. Uh, remember, ladies, that you each of you have our live only each chapter events our vip members who register early have the opportunity to either win a three minute spotlight or submit questions from these amazing women our next live event will be november 29th at 4 p.m however you can register for the rerun recognizing applauding your leadership skills breaking down the ba barriers and you can do so right now on your screen uh, you can replay that you should have also seen the screen ability to register um, for, sorry, that was my, my script <laughs> that you should have that on your screen. Also, thank you to 300 plus members who have attended today. We really do appreciate your time in joining us. If any of our attendees have further questions for a speaker, please feel free to reach out to them. The information is on the PowerPoint, which you can download right now underneath the chat room. If you see that on there, it has both PowerPoint presentations um it's just they're both the same i promise it's just one has a lower um, memory than the other so you can download them very quickly and easily we'll be receiving an e-chapter email post um survey which will have today's attendees list and can connect with them again on nepw.com and continue networking with those that attended in our e-chapter all the e-chapters are recorded and saved to YouTube on the NAPW e-chapter channel for those of you that would like to watch and share with your colleagues. I highly encourage you to do that. It's amazing for, for you to get, just retrain your brain and just keep listening to it over and over again. Upcoming corporate events also, FYI, we have two amazing power networking events. Um, as I introduced earlier, Ruth from our Los Angeles chapter will be hosting on November 17th with, with Star Jones, and the link to register will be on the chat feed shortly. We also hope to see you there. Anyone that's in the LA area, we'd love to have you join us. A corporate email list, if you have any questions regarding your membership, including benefits, how to navigate the website, upgrades, renewals, upcoming events in person or online, I was chatting with a couple of members that would like to participate in some of the local chapter events, please see the emails listed on the PowerPoint um, below and you can reach out, you can answer the questions. I know Ruth put hers on there, Natalie put hers on there, and I did as well. Our emails were on there. So again, thank you so much. What do you have to do after we do this? After you hang up, you close your browser, everything, what's the next step? Connect with at least three members post each chapter. I know you can pick at least three attendees off the list that we send you and connect with them, whether it's locally, in person, via email, via phone, and so forth. You'd be surprised what you can share and how you can benefit from each other in that connection. Make sure you're signed up for the next e-chapter or e-coaching event, which we're very excited about. 
And don't forget to take the post e-chapter survey that I mentioned earlier. Your feedback is extremely important to us in assisting us to enhance our member experience. We do apologize for any technical difficulties you may have had with our sound and so forth. As you can imagine, we're all connecting from different places. But we'd like to thank you again for an amazing eChapter event, and we look forward to seeing you next time. Enjoy the rest of your day. Make it a productive week, ladies. Thank you so much.